Good morning, peeps, and welcome back to my channel. I am feeling much better than I was when I made my video yesterday, so I thought I'd do a second one for you that has a bit more information in it. And today I'm going to talk about series Bibles. Um, I promised several people I would, so I thought today would be a good time. I will show you how I make my Bibles for my different series and why they are so useful in keeping everything straight. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. Hit that ringer bell so you get notified when I have new videos out. And if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up because that does help the algorithms. So sit tight and I will be right back and we will get started here. So you may notice first off that for my series Bibles, I use regular three ring binders and I make sure that they're thick enough to handle the entire series. Along the spine, I print out and tape the title of the series and you'll notice these are about two inch binders. I make a cover for it. I always make sure I have one that has the plastic um, inserts on front. And I will make a cover. Usually it's the first cover of the first, or it's the cover of the first book. And I just print it out and then I slide it in there. So now I know what Bible this is, what series Bible this is. I use a lot of binders. I love three ring binders. And so I have a number of them for all sorts of different things. Um, so I make sure each one is labeled and I always label the spine because when they're on the shelf, they're always spine out. So first thing you'll notice is I put a plastic pocket divider in here. Uh, that's to hold things. I, you can of course hold things down in here. Ah, without my nails, it's really hard to get into there. I, you can of course hold things in there and I do. But for small things, and stuff that gets lost really easy, um, I, I put them in here. Right now I don't have it, anything in there, but uh, usually I do. You will notice that my series Bible has a number of tabs here. First, let me talk about what a series Bible is. My definition. A series Bible, in my definition, is like an encyclopedia for your series. It's not the place where you plot. It's not the place where you scribble down notes. It is the place for information that has come out through the various books that you may need in the future. So that's the way I use a series Bible. You'll notice that I use these plastic dividers. I prefer plastic because paper gives off so much dust and paper dividers seem to deteriorate a lot faster. Um, while I print out new information, a lot of times with almost every book, so I have the pages actually fresh, the, the dividers can deteriorate and get a lot of dust on them, and they just kind of bother me. Plus, these are reusable. You can reuse these in different projects. If you finish a series and you decide you want to disassemble your series Bible, or if you use these for, say, another project that you finish, once you're done, you can reuse them, which is why I don't write on the tab. Instead of writing on the tab, I use these. Uh, they're little plastic post-it notes, kind of. Uh, they're made by post-it, actually. And I use Sharpies, Sharpies to write on them, because other kind of inks can wear off and rub off really easily. What I do is I, I write the name of the section on there. I put it on and then I use tape to keep it there because while these stick fairly well, a lot of times if you're if you're moving the Bible around, if you're carrying it, it can really get off center. It can really it can knock things askew. So I just take a strip of strapping tape, which I love so much better than scotch tape. Um, I buy it by six rolls at a time and we use, I use strapping tape almost exclusively. Once in a while I'll use something like scotch tape, 
but um, or you know the the small tape, but uh, stopping tape I love. So I will write the name of the section on the post-it tab and then I will tape it to the plastic and then when I'm done, say I finished you know using this in a different section or something, I can pull that off and I still have a clean sheet to use again. So people often want to know what sections I put in here. I have a long list. I write long series and the longer the series you have, the more information there is to keep track of. Under characters, first I keep a character birthday sheet. So I know when their birthdays are because if the series spans several years, whether it be in our world or in theirs especially, you need to know when they change age because age comes up. So this is for the Wild Hunt, and these are the birthdays of the main characters in the Wild Hunt. Now for my Supernaturals, they won't have a year on it. Because, you know, Raven is, I think, 116 years old or something. Um, but I do like giving them each birthday, and I usually uh, assign them a birthday based on their personality and the zodiac. So you'll notice that their personalities kind of fit their zodiac signs. Now this is a sample character page. I do not create my characters before I start a book. Therefore this information comes out as I write the book, which is why I update it quite often. I have their eye color, their hair, their skin color, height, weight, body type, age, ethnic background, birthday, abilities, their address, their nicknames, special marks they have, their home in terms of city, where they were born basically, and the magical or species abilities. And then I have their bio. I have relatives, and sometimes those relatives will have their own pages if they are a major character. But I have their relatives, I have their background, just very basic background, and relationships that they've had. Now you'll notice sometimes a uh, character spans two or even three or four pages. With my Other World series Bible, some of the main characters had five or six pages of information. I also have the magic that they can do. Not all of it, I'll show you that in a, in a moment, but just some of the basic types of magic they work. I put these in alphabetical order. You notice that was Angel. Then comes Charlie, Charlie the Vampire, and then we have Ember, and so on. So I do that for all my main characters. And by main characters, I mean common recurring characters that have more than uh, a little bit parts. Like Erica, the police officer who's Victor's friend, she does not have her own page. She's not a main character. She's what I call a secondary character. So all my main characters have a page. And I update it as necessary. And usually with each book I'll add something in. If something happened to, you know, change or add to the information I have here. Now here are my secondary character sheets. And you notice I use the plastic tabs. They stick better to paper so I don't tape them down. And I can just peel them off and use them when I reprint these out with each book. So secondary characters are like Akron, the raven shifter who leads the cleanup crew for Hearn. Um, and Aoife, like the priestess of Morgana, although she's mentioned in more than one place in my series Bible. Uh, you don't need to see that person. She's coming up in sun Sun broken. So, yeah, secondary characters I do in a table, and it gives sometimes it gives their their looks because if I have to describe them again, it's easier than trying to remember what they look like. Um, sometimes I don't. The D is for deceased. Um, so yeah, my secondary characters page. Now here are my minor characters. 
and I divide them since I write paranormal in terms of there's the humans and these are characters who have small recurring roles roles like the bartenders like um, well, like Ginty is a secondary character because he's got more of a role than, say, the bartender, Wendy. So the secondary characters um, or the tertiary characters are my minor characters go here. And they just have basically a line about them. And I often put the initials of the book that they are first found in or that they are seen in so that I know where to look if I need to look back and see what they they did. So my minor characters. Now also under characters I have villains and human, fae, anti-fae, shifters, ogres, so on. So here are my villains and if they have a D they're deceased and if they don't they are still at large. And again, I use a table format. I also always put a header on each section because if there are more than one page and I happen to drop the papers, it makes it much easier to sort out. So that's it for my character section. And we come to the second section. For me, it's subcult. What this section is for me is it is a description and sometimes a listing of characters of what different uh, paranormal species are, like the anti fey You know, it's the anti fey are the predecessors of the fey races. They are unique individuals. The exosan are the anti fey open to interacting with humans. They're usually younger. And then I give a, a list of the prominent ones that are mentioned and a bit more about them. So this is kind of like the character section, but a little more involved in terms of what type of creatures and beings I have in my world. So I'll have anti fay Then I have my crypto glossary, cryptozoid. The anti fay the cryptos, the elves, the giants, and these are just very small um, mentions about what they are like and, and the types because I have so many different types of creatures in my series um, like the light fey and the different types of fey that I have listed under the light fey the different types of shifters that I have listed um, the dark fey different types of dark fey uh, the hippocampi the foam born the Hippoca uh, hippocampus water horse shifters are a different subset of fae, so they are not under either light or dark. The same with the forest divas, the vanleviches, um, the sub fae, and I have a list of creatures who are under the sub fae, which you will see on the next page. And over here, I have under the types of shifters, the packs of shifters. You'll see I've got these two sections here. Um, yeah, under here, subfate, the garden gnolls, the goblins, the knickernackers, the knuckle bones or nixie knacks, the kobolds, the kobe uh whites, will-o'-the-wisps. Under here, then we have come to vampires. And you'll see why that's kind of blank for now in a moment. And I have monsters. Like the Eileen Chahan. Um, and I'm not sure how that's pronounced totally, but that was the creature in Iron Bones. Or Cuveo, the demonic creature they fought in the first book. Uh, the Liches, uh, Nightwings, which you will, you will meet in a future book. Um, they've been mentioned, though. Other creatures that aren't quite monsters, but are kind of almost interdimensional creatures, like the Ethos Spiders from Silver Mist and Lightning Flits, which are the creatures that are created when Karananos shatters lightning by um, to make light orbs, the orbs that they use for light. And over here we have Elementals. Um, 
and these are more monsters. I haven't got much on the elementals because I'm doing pages on them by their own self. The Pater Monstrous, nature spirits who aren't fey. Um, demons, spirits, and that's a little underutilized here. Uh, in, other in other books, that category would be filled, like with Whisper Hollow. And dragons, you don't get to see. Dragons are coming up in Sunbroken. Yes, you get to see dragons. Uh, my information on gargoyles. And then we have research I've done on the Fomorians. And lastly, my vampires and all the physical effects and attributes the vampires in this particular world can and can't do. Their political aspects, because vampires are very political in the Wild Hunt series, and they are very powerful in the political scene and in this world. So there is the section on my, I call it my bestiary or my um, crypto glossary. Then I have a section on the Wild Hunt itself. And this is not the Wild Hunt as in the mythological one that goes through the sky, um, which the Wild Hunt Agency was named after. This is um, the Wild Hunt Agency and agencies like it around the world because, as you've seen in the series, there are more than one agency that does the same service. Now, since in <clears throat> The Eternal Return, they went over to Maliki Zero, I wrote up a series about Maliki Zero, which is another hunt type service. Then I have the wild hunt itself. I have description of what it does, where it is in Seattle, what the actual building is like, the rules for the wild hunt agency, their code structure, other agencies connected with the wild hunt like Monkey's Arrow, um, contractors that work with them, and the rules of parlay for the Wild Hunt parlays with the Fae. Next in my series Bible, plots and subplots, and you don't get to see that one. Now we come to a section I call language and vocabulary. This encompasses a whole lot of different things. One, I keep track of the internet and cyberspace names, like the, the websites and the services like Undercast, Undershot, Undersurf, those are the dark web places, Encyclopedia, Mythotopia, Home Time, a social media site, uh, Zone, which is like Zoom or Skype. Then I keep track of movies and shows that they like to watch, especially Raj. Raj the Gargoyle loves TV, like he loves Acrobat, Acrobert and the Alpha is a cartoon about Bert, an acrobat. And over here I have who likes to watch it. And I label that one internet. Now you notice the next section is labeled slang or vocabulary. Street slang, cryptos, streeps, xeno, group specific speak. This is like the Deolethi, the ancient language of the anti fey Nuva, light variant of fey speak. Turnadeth, the most ancient fey tongue. Turneth, dark variant of fey speak tech terms that I've created, like the Degometer, which detects magical and technical bugs, Dim Lens, a low-light illumination device, um, and vocabulary that is specific to my series. Uh, for instance, the Axotite Meteors, that was very used a lot during Book 3 um, because of what it, it is an actual thing. The Axotite meteors are an actual um, type of meteor, but I wanted to remember it so I wouldn't have to go hunting it down. Um, and then I get into things like divine agency. It's the term given to any divinity appointed agency that has official standing with the government, authority to punish criminals. So I have like a definition of some of the the terms and phrases I use in my books. Uh, Flophouse, where the streeps often stay. Um, ghosts, and that is from Sun 
broken, so you don't get to see it till it comes out. Um, but also, you know, just other things like that. And over here, I have the drugs that are common to my series, like crackling, which is a much worse variant of crack. And of course, there's rohypnol, which is a drug today, but it was used in this series. Um, and I wanted to remember that. And then the Xfong, a knockout drug, which is a creation of mine. On the second page of this, I have foods that, you know, names of drinks and stuff. And specific holidays. Now, the pagan holidays are used widely in this series because I'm pagan. And, and most of the characters in this series would be called pagan. But I also have holidays I've made up, like the Dwarven Spring Holidays, Fay Day, um, things like that. Now I come to the Places section of my series Bible. Now because I write fantasy, urban fantasy, I'm going to be <clears throat> intermixing fictional settings with actual settings. So I keep track of every place that I've mentioned and I divide it into fictional city, fictional cities, Nevain. Um, actually, Turnanok should be on there too. I don't know why it isn't. So I am going to make a note and next time I update this, which will be after writing Witching Moon, I will look through and I will make a note to add Tiern and Nog. And then the actual cities, actual street names, fictional street names, districts, fictional, and then actual. Fictional lakes, rivers, islands, bridges, actual. Fictional mountains, which I, this In this one, I actually kind of... No, I didn't reverse it. That's just the heading. Never mind. Um, fictional mountains and mystical places. And then, of course, the actual mountains and forests. Uh, actual... Sometimes I put actual first. Sometimes fictional. It depends on what I'm doing at that time. <laughs> But I make sure that they're labeled. The actual parks, the fictional parks, and in this case, like Castle Hall and the Underlake District, which Underlake District is fictional. Um, the Castle Hall, of course, is fictional. But I put the history of it so that if I needed to, because it will come up again in other books, I wanted to be able to just glance at my series Bible and see what it was if I happened to forget for some reason. And underground places. Um, you notice the portal gates is not filled out very much. I'm going to take that off of there next time because now I've created a separate section for it. And then I have some general things. Now also under places I have shops and services and fictional and there will also be an actual just like there were with the place names. I divided, okay, shops and shopping malls, services, which are more like um, real estate companies, private eyes, um, Cal Technology, which was a video game developer. And then I have actual restaurants, fictional again, and actual nightclubs and bars and hotels, banks and buildings schools, libraries, sporting arenas that have been mentioned, um, apartments, seeing or sightseeing places, uh, newspapers, magazines, etc., churches, fictional, um, or temples, and that includes not just Christian but other things, and sanctuary houses and way stations, because those are important in my series medical clinics. After that, I have a few specific places that I wanted more information on. So Winter Hall Academy, um, 
And that's it for here. Next section. Magical systems. Magic in my world. First, I have magical incantations based on the user. The magical incantations Ember uses are the ones that Merrily uses. And Raven's incantations. After their incantations, I have... some of Raven's runes. You notice there aren't nearly as many runes as she actually has. That's because I am an organic writer. As they are, as they come out in the books, I add them. I don't create them ahead of time. And these are magical powders, waters, tools. Um, so I have the name, what they do, and who they belong to or who uses them. Next section is the gods. Here you can see that I have now created a ta uh, table of where the portals in the wild world are because I've gotten so many I don't want to have to run all over trying to find them. So portals in the wild world. Then we have the lands that are in Anwen and a little bit on the Tuath and Formorian Wars because that happened there. I have information on the Fey Courts, both here on Earth and across the Great Sea, which is somewhere in Anwen, in the lands of fire and ice. And again, um, I actually put more on the Tuath and Fomorian Wars here, which I, at some point, need to create an entire page of. So I have character pages for the gods, and they are here rather than with the other characters, because they go under the, you know, this section for gods, elementals, stuff like that. So I have them for Bridget, I have for Karananos, for Morgana, and I also have descriptions of their palaces that have been described in the books and names of their servants. And basically what this allows me to do is come here next time I write a scene about the palace and get the information on what it looks like and what where things are in it. And if I add to it on the next update of my Wild Hunt notebook, I will add to the page. So now we're at the section for groups and organizations. So you'll notice with the force majeure, I haven't got it all filled out because, again, I'm an organic writer. I don't create these things ahead of time. I fill them out as I go. And I have information on the government, the United Coalition and a bit on the Seattle government. Then I have groups and organizations based on whether they're fey, human, vampire-based, weir-based, crypto-based, actual groups, military-based, magical groups. And under the groups, I also have information on Locke, the Library of Cryptic Knowledge. And of course, since it was such a big part for several books, the Two Othing Brotherhood. And I have information based on what came out in the books because who knows, maybe it'll come back and I will want to know the background of what I wrote in all the different books. Then I have a flora and fauna section and I'm going to go through here a little more faster. And that just has the flora and fauna of both in Anwen and over here that are mentioned. Then I have my research section and this is where I put printouts. I found a wonderful article on castle terminology. So I printed it out. So I have that castle terminology. The basics of elk hunting. Why? Because it just seems to fit. <laughs> Information on Mount Rainier. On the Olympic Peninsula because they go over there. Common sword types. And lastly, I have a section where I have the timeline of the books and then in order I have each of the books. I put the cover and I put the blurb for the book and then I put the date the book came out. So I do that for every single book. Now you may be wondering where I get all this information. Do I have to go through the books? No. Not necessarily, not usually. 
what I do is I ask my editor to send me what's called the style sheets. Now I used to get these with Berkeley and when I went to Andy and found my editor she created the style sheets as well and I asked her to send them to me with each book. So what they are are they are a listing. For instance uh, the forces. The forces are ele to elementals what the anti fay are to the fay. Uh, Franklin Prince, as he was on his deathbed, his wife Mary had a keeper's seal. Full blooded, no hyphen. Full moon magic, a witchcraft shop at the Tandy Court Mall. Fumblebutt, Hearn's nickname for R Mr. Rumblebutt. Fizgil Motti, a uh, type of curse. You see, it has all the basic information in it. And I go through with the first style sheet after I've written the first book and I create my series, basic series Bible from that. And that's when I also create the characters. And that takes a little more doing. Your very first run through at a series Bible will take you a while to create because you have to create your character sheets and so forth. But every time I get a new book, I ask my editor to send me the new style sheets. And I go through and I will mark off what has been entered already and what hasn't changed. So on the style sheets, I will do like, like a line. And then I will highlight the words that need to be entered. The terms or you know, everything that needs to be entered on the series Bible, which wasn't there last time. So I keep the old style sheet, I pull out the last style sheet. Now this is an old one, and frankly it's out of date and everything has been entered. But I, I pull out the next style sheet and I go through and I mark match them up and I highlight the terms that are not that were not in the last one on the new one. So that way I can go through and I can just see what hasn't been entered yet. I also, at that point, any time a new major character comes, I have to create a new character sheet. Another thing that I do is, for me, since I've got an assistant, it makes it easier, but get your books in Kindle. Make sure you have them in Kindle because you can search on Kindle for information. It's so easy. You just put the search term in the search box. And so, for example, um, recently I asked my assistant to get me all the information she could find on Bridget's Castle. So all she had to do was enter Bridget's Castle into the search term on Kindle and then, you know, copy all the information for me off of there and send it to me so I could create the new page for Bridget's Castle. It's not that difficult. It does take a little bit of time but it can save you a world of heartache. It can keep things clear. It can keep you from making a mistake that I made like with the Fury series. I killed off a character in book four and somehow I brought him back in book five. I didn't have my series Bible up to date when I looked through there and I was in a rush and I was like, I can't remember. Was he there? Was he there? Was he dead? Was he? I think he was alive. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> so basically, this will tell you. And when you when you kill off a character, whether they're a minor character or not, you put a D by him to basically say they're deceased. So whenever I'm bringing back an old character, ideally, I go look in my series Bible, and I find out whether they are still alive or not. Or I find out, say, what color their eyes are, how tall they are. Um, it, it saves a world of trouble if you create yourself a series Bible. And if you're not writing paranormal, it's going to be a little easier in some ways. Although, if you have a historical series, I imagine it would be a whole lot of research that you would save time and money because time is money, you would save a whole lot of time if you just had it in your series Bible. Uh, for example, the kind of foods they ate in a certain time period, things like that. Once I create the pages, I do it in Word, then I print them out. Then you just take your three hole punch, which granted this is a, 
unusual three-hole punch in that it's a fairly large one. But I, I use them for punching laminated pages too. And this one will do it. And it will also punch up to there. It will also punch up to 40 pages at a time. Now I use a heavier stock paper, so it won't go that many. But it is very heavy duty and it's not going to break on me. I also have a seven hole punch um, to punch my printables for my planners. And I have a one hole punch in case one of the holes doesn't quite punch right. Then I can just do the small ones in between. So that's how I create my series Bible. Doesn't take a whole lot. You need a three ring binder. You need, you know, dividers. And I use plastic ones, but you don't need you can use paper if you like. You need your post-it notes, and I do recommend getting the plastic ones here, but again, you can make use of paper and tape it on there if you want. Um, and you need some paper, and you need your basic word program or whatever you want to create it in. So that's, that's how I use my series Bible. Saves me a headache. It saves me a massive, massive amount of headaches. And it's kind of fun, and it refreshes you with the series each time you update it. I recommend updating it after every book that you write. Sometimes when I'm writing fairly fast, I'll, I'll update it every two books. But again, you can save a lot of headaches and mistakes by keeping yourself an up-to-date series Bible. So there you go. That's how I create it. I hope this helps. If you like this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you next week for something else. Take care. Bye-bye.